Okay, let's get started here. I'm going to have to do something here that I don't usually have to do, but uh, give me one second. I, um, I sent Brian my title slide this week actually early and uh, then forgot to put it into my, uh, into my slide. So hang on a second here. Okay, sorry about that. So this week we're going to talk about the emerging convergence of the urgent. Okay, and um, in a couple of weeks we'll probably be talking about the resurging of the emerging convergence of the urgent, and uh, and then the continuing resurgence of the emerging convergence of the urgent. So we've got titles, I and mean, we got them. They're just coming like crazy here, and we do talk about convergence. I um, let me just get a couple things out of the way from a housekeeping standpoint. Um, I spoke at the Denver Prophecy Summit last weekend. I did two talks, one on the Mountain of Israel, one on uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, Woe to the Pastors, kind of an updated one I've done before. Uh, I know that the Mountains of Israel one is it's different than any one I've ever done on the Mountains of Israel, and that's up at, uh, if you go to Doug Hamp, D-O-U-G, Hamp, H-A-M-P, M as in Mary, H-A-M-P, Doug Hamp, YouTube channel, you'll be able to find the Mountains of Israel one, and the other one should be up there. I'm not sure when they're going to be able to get it posted. They had to record it and edit it a little bit differently than some of the others. And we had a great time. Uh, one thing about Denver, um, it's supposedly like 300 and some days of sunshine a year, and one of them was the, on one of the four days that I was there. The others was very cloudy. It was cold. Uh, for, the, for August, it was like the high temperature one day was like 69 degrees. But about three months ago, I don't know if you heard about this, they had a hailstorm in Denver. Softball-sized hail went from uh, Evergreen, which is near the mountains on the west side of Denver, through Golden, uh, Arbeda, Lakewood, Wheat Ridge, all the way to Brighton. It's about a 30-mile swath. I talked to a, a man at the conference who has a contract to do roof inspections. He used to be in the roofing business. And he said that in the Denver, in that area, they have to replace or rep heavily repair 150,000 roofs as a result of that. I mean, I saw some driving around. They were just ripped to shreds. They had somewhere, and when I started booking uh, a rental car, a lot of them at the airport were $150 a day for a compact, uh, all the way up to a van was running $335 a day. Uh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, it would have cost, for a four-day rental, it would have cost me $1,300 for a van. Uh, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, I asked, and he told me, he says, well, they had over 200,000 cars that were heavily damaged to totaled by the hailstorm, and so everybody's renting a car, and they have portable tents set up, and it, it reminded me of the, the thing that you read about in Revelation. This was softball size hail, and in Revelation, it talks about 100-pound hailstones raining down. So you imagine the kind of damage it would do. The initial estimate there was... $300 million to repair the damage. There's a large uh, Mills outlet mall there on the west side, Colorado Mills, a couple million square feet. It's closed for si over six months for repairs. And the total damages associated with that mall alone are just under $400 million from loss of use and lost rent and profits and repairs. It was a, it's a stunning thing. I mean, you just, uh, you don't think about it. It was the worst storm, they said, in Colorado history. Uh, and you don't hear that much about it uh, because it, it's on the news one day. I remember hearing about it, but the hailstones melt and everybody forgets about it, but all the damage is left behind. And so it's just, a, it's an indication that there are these things coming and we get these little previews and snippets of it. Now, I'm going to make a comment on this. There's a lot of stuff on the internet about uh, the solar eclipse and the uh, September 23rd sign in the heavens. And a lot of people, I mean, there's 
and it, it's, it's become very divisive. If you don't agree with me that Psalm 23 is when the rapture is going to occur or something like that, we have to divide over this. And I think that's unfortunate. Uh, I will only say this. Uh, there's plenty of things going on in the world right now for you to pay attention and get your life right with the Lord and share the gospel with people and tell people that their only hope is being saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. That's going to save them. And so while these things are interesting and they may be, you know, I just haven't studied them enough, I will confess to that, because there's plenty of stuff going on to make you wake up and be aware, even if the eclipse wasn't happening or even if there wasn't this thing on September 23rd which some people say it's unique, some people say it's not. You know, you can make up your own. But listen, I'm just telling you is there's plenty of stuff out there for you to be paying attention to what's going on in the world, even if those things have no significance. And we'll go through some of those. We go through these each week. We will in a few weeks, two weeks actually, two weeks from yesterday, we'll be having a little conference here with Patrick Wood from Technocracy News, Mike Clapp and myself, Steve Mitchell. And I'm going to talk a little bit. We're going to talk, I at least I and Patrick will be talking about uh, technocracy, artificial intelligence, some of the things that are coming on the technology side that are very concerning. And as I, I look around and I watch what's going on and as I'm preparing that talk, I, every day there's something new coming about all these technological marvels that are being introduced into our world and culture, but they're also concerning. For example, you know, they're now editing genes in, um, in embryos, human, human embryos, to get rid of certain diseases. And they're soon going to take that technology over. But the problem is, and even Elon Musk, uh, who runs Tesla, at a vast loss, by the way, it makes a lot of money doing it. Um, he says, if you're not concerned about AI, artificial intelligence safety, you should be vastly more risk than North Korea. I think I agree with him on that because what's happening is this artificial intelligence is developing without any ethical standards in many respects. And so people are being left to make it up on their own. That bothers me because of all of the things that we see going on in the world. Um, there are even, there's even this. This is uh, out of Wisconsin. Company workers choose to be chipped. And here's a picture of the guy being chipped. Here's a little uh, Associated Press report on that. This and saw it being used in other societies. We said, why not us? Why not us bring it? And provide a solution that we can use for so many different things, not just opening doors, not just self-checkout in our markets, so many other different things. And at the end of the day, you, there's one thing that, that I know I speak for every one of our employees, is we're going to be responsible, we're going to be respectful with what we're going to do. The device isn't really, as a business, what we're interested in capitalizing off of. It's the software that runs the device that has the benefits to it. So that's really where we come from as a software company. So my concern just is with the health effect. Look, what's going to happen to my body when I'm putting this foreign object into my hand and down the road? Because it was FDA approved in 2004, but that's still not very long term in, in my book. So I'd just like to know more about the long term health effects. But you may at some point have it done. I could. I'm not saying never. I do think it's the wave of the future. Um, I think that uh, opinion research that's looked at um, what people who are on the cutting edge of developing these technologies think is that they, they many of them believe we are going to be combining technology in our bodies. So the question is uh, that everybody asks, and there, there is a passage in Revelation uh, that talks about the mark of the beast, uh, Revelation 16. Revelation 14, I don't know if this is the mark of the beast. What I do know is that the technology now exists 
to do this on a massive scale very quickly and easily and track people. So I, I don't know. I, my personal view on it is, after looking at the scripture, and it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, so what is tied together there? A mark in the hand or forehead, and what? Worshiping the beast and his image. And we know that there'll be this image set up in this temple, rebuilt temple, and this Antichrist will go in and declare himself above all that is called God, commit what will be called the abomination of desolation. This is in the middle of the 70th week. And so there is a a connection there between the worship of the beast and his image and the mark. So right now, I don't see the worship of the beast connected with these microchips and that sort of things, but it may come to that. And so you should be aware and cautious of what you're doing. Uh, but the technology exists. I saw that uh, China has now put in place scanners that are re releasing technology uh, to get people that try to avoid traffic cameras. You know, some people, they say you can go to Pep Boys or another auto parts store and you can buy a reflector for your license plate so the camera can't read your license plate. So now what they're doing is they've developed technology that will fingerprint your car. Uh, chips, scratches, and that type of things that are unique to your car that will be kept and stored in a database. And you know, <coughs> it's almost like a barcode. Car is acting like a barcode. Now, I play golf with a, a group of guys, and, and my one friend he has, he calls it his golf car. He only drives it when we go to play golf. And it's some of the stuff on it doesn't work. You know, if you want to see what the – Temperature gauge says you got to pound on the dash. Uh, and yesterday we were driving up uh, to Mount Vernon to play, and we hit a deer. Um, and it ran into the side of the car right where I was. It didn't damage any of the metal on the car. It might have knocked the wheel out of alignment, we think. But it damaged the mirror on the car, although if you looked at this mirror on the car, uh, you would think, why haven't you gotten that fixed? And it's like, well, it's just a golf car, you know, so we it's only you guys that get in it. So, and, but that car has a unique signature. You would recognize this car anywhere. So there was more damage to the mirror than there already was. Um, and I don't know what happened to the deer. I, I assume it got up and ran away and maybe died. Who knows? But, I mean, it hit hard. I mean, it was but, – uh, but, but China will now be able to track all of that information about your car. That ding you never got fixed on the back door will be used to get you tickets and and this is all this is bought and they'll also do facial recognition on people driving in the car to identify who's driving in the car so it's coming we don't know exactly what it is yet but just know that the technology is there for somebody to implement it on a massive scale very quickly this is um, Vogue. This is uh, Brand Brad Brandon Bradley Manning. Brandon Mal Manning. Bradley Manning, who uh, had a sex change, is now Chelsea Manning. Was in the army, stole some top secret stuff, and turned it over to the press. And now Vogue has a photo spread on Chelsea Manning, and says Chelsea. This is what they tweeted the other day changed the course of history, now she's focusing on herself. Uh, genetically, still a guy, but that doesn't matter in this world anymore. We, we can't figure out whether people are male or female. Somebody marked up the tweet. I thought that was good. Chelsea Manning is a traitor. Now he's focusing on himself. So I think that was right. In Australia, we talk sometimes about some of the things going on in Canada uh, that don't make sense. And this is all over. I guess the point of this is it's all over the place. 
in um, the state of, I think, Queensland and Australia, one of the school districts there has issued a uh, report or a, a guidelines that young children, I mean, we're talking kids in kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, first grade, are not allowed to talk about Jesus in the schoolyard because it will be considered bullying to people, other people. This and this is so what? So they're doing this to kids and they'll they'll stop at the kids, right? They're not going to stop at the kids. Departmental policy defines evangelizing as preaching or advocating a cause or religion with the object of making converts to Christianity. Now, isn't that discriminatory? Is there anything about other religions? About secularism or anything else? No, it's just Christianity. Examples of evangelizing cited in the review, as well as two earlier reviews into religious instruction providers, include sharing Christmas cards that refer to Jesus' birth. That's, that's prohibited. Creating Christmas tree decorations to give away and making beaded bracelets to give to friends as a way of sharing the good news about Jesus. Now, when you hear this, you know, as people say, is the reaction is, okay, where did they get their graduate degree from, the people that made that up? Because you, you have to have the common sense absolutely beat out of you to come up with these kind of policies. Um, so as one report says, Sunshine State sacked Son of God as Queensland bureaucrats last Christianity lessons. And, and, what, and what was going on there is that they, they do allow some religious instruction in the schools in a set-aside period. But now Christianity, evangelical Christianity, is off the table if they have their way. And I think this is coming everywhere. There was this report this week about this Google employee who wrote uh, a memo about the fact that trying to figure out why there are fewer women working in the tech field than men, and it got distributed through Google, and then somebody sent it outside of Google, then Google got some heat, and so the guy got fired. And everybody says, you know, I, I don't agree with him, but, you know, it's so he has a, a view. He's well-reasoned. He's thoughtful. He's a good employee. But what happened? He lost his job with Google. And I think the headline that I saw today, and I don't remember where I saw this, Google doesn't care what's good for us, what's best for us. They care about making money. And I know a lot of people who have uh, monetize their videos that are Christians or conservative politically. They've had their videos pretty much 90% or more of them have been demonetized. You can't get advertising off them because it's not acceptable under Google standards. And eventually Google will ban them. Dennis Prager had, runs a thing called Prager University. Give us five minutes, we'll give you a semester. Is there, and they have it's probably the most watched private YouTube channel in the world. They will probably get somewhere in the order of uh, 500 million views this year. I mean, we got uh, over 2 million last year here. So they're like 25, what is that, 250 times bigger. And they do it. They don't, they don't monetize it. But what Google has done is they've delisted in other words, they don't show up well. You have to kind of dig through them, and they're, they're labeled inappropriate for younger people. Dennis Prager videos that talk about ID, ideas are inappropriate for young people. There are 34 of them now that are, are delisted or not on the approved list. They're still up. You can still get to them, but they're restricted. And you see all the junk that's out there, and they restrict Dennis Prager. What, what do you think? Look, you know, we're exploring alternatives here. We have other alternatives up. And so this Google employee got um, fired. 
you know, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus gives us some indication of things that are going to be going on at the end. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Matthew 24, verse 4, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. We'll talk about that in a minute. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these things, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. This sounds like a prophecy about Facebook. I mean, everybody gets their, it's, um, you know, people, I, I don't have time to monitor everything that comes my way on my Facebook timeline, and people will tag me in a post. Um, and I, I don't agree, oh, so here's a disclaimer. I don't agree with everything that people tag me in, even though I don't block it and hide it, okay? You, I mean, really, think about it. I, there's, what, a couple, hundreds of hours of stuff that I've taught about up online. And you should know that I don't agree with everything that I get tagged in. But here's what happens is somebody will tag me in a post about some cultural issue, and pretty soon people are fighting about something that's not even related to the original post. So my advice is, you know, be careful what you tag me in, please, and stay on topic for crying out loud. <laughs> Don't wander off into all these fights, and it's, but I think this verse is, many shall be offended and shall betray one another. False prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall bound, the love of many shall wax cold. And I, we're certainly seeing the beginnings of this, even in the church. So, look, I'm a lawyer. My whole life is an argument. Okay, so I don't mind arguments, but these pronouncements that, boy, you don't agree with me on this particular little slice of end times teaching, you're a heretic, you're not saved. Folks, dial it back a little bit, please, okay? And look, and I, like I said, I love arguments. I, I do it all day long for a living, I have for 37 years of my life even longer, because I started law school before that. So 40 years since I started law school. This month, 40 years ago this month, I've been involved in arguments. And I don't mind it, but I'm bothered by what I see a lot of times going on on my Facebook po or posts on my Facebook timeline. Uh, it's just, it's crazy. So, um, but this is what Jesus said would be like in the end times. I may have mentioned this a few weeks ago, uh, a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago when I was here. There was this article that was in a Vatican-approved journal. It had to be approved by the Pope, written by a Jesuit and a Presbyterian minister who's very tight with Roman Catholics, called Evangelical Fundamentalism and Catholic Integ Integralism, a Surprising Ecumenism. And it was very critical of evangelicals and Catholics working on certain social, political, cultural issues. Here is a report from Fox News about, I guess it was a, a week, well, earlier this week. In this week's Focus on Faith, some American Catholics are outraged about an article by two close associates of Pope Francis that compares hardline Christian conservatives in the U.S. to jihadists. Religion correspondent Lauren Green has more from New York. Pope Francis' silence is speaking loud and clear. At least that's what some believe, as two of his closest confidants rail against the political collaboration that's grown strong between evangelicals and conservative Catholics, particularly in their support of President Trump. In the liberal Jesuit publication La Civilta Catolica, Father Antonio Spadaro and Protestant pastor Marcelo Figueroa 
say the alliance has become radicalized, calling it an ecumenism of hate. That is, a xenophobic and Islamic phobic vision that wants walls and purifying deportations. The Catholic League's Bill Donahue blasted the article. The idea of Catholics and evangelicals working together in the culture war is a good thing for America. We finally have a president who is religion friendly, unlike his predecessor. And we hope to capitalize on that. And we're not going to be scared away by some screed coming out of the Vatican. Exit polls show 80% of white evangelicals who voted went for Trump. They join ranks with conservative Catholic groups on hot-button social issues like abortion and traditional marriage. Their biggest concern is religious liberty. Writing in his weekly column, Philadelphia Archbishop Charles Chaput, whose conservative leanings experts say have placed him out of favor with Francis, called the article willfully ignorant and ignores the fact that America's culture wars weren't wanted and weren't started by people faithful to constant Christian belief. Catholic professor Peter Kreeft says the rift is a product of the media and that Christianity is not a political system. It's not political liberalism, it's not political conservatism. Uh, in a sense it's both, uh, you know, a liberal heart and a conservative head. Neither Pope Francis nor the Vatican has commented. So, listen, in some of those images there, um, well, here's, here's what a little bit of the article said. Another interesting subject is the relationship with creation of these religious groups that are composed mainly of whites from the Deep South, American South. There is sort of an anesthetic with regard to ecological disasters and problems generated by climate change. They profess dominionism and consider ecologists as people who are against the Christian faith. They place their own roots in a literalist understanding of the creation narratives of the book of Genesis to put humanity in a position of dominion over creation while creation remains subject to human will and biblical submission. In this theological vision, natural disasters, dramatic climate change, and the global ecological crisis are not only not perceived as an alarm that should lead them to reconsider their dogmas, but they are seen as their complete opposite. Signs that confirm their non-allegorical understanding of the final figures of the book of Revelation and their apocalyptic hope in a new heaven and a new earth. This is from a close associate of the Pope. You understand the significance of this. And listen, we all believe in this sort of end-time catastrophes. Al Gore's made over $100 million off of it fostering his brand of fear. Nobody ever gets on him about that because it's politically correct. But take the book of Revelation literally, and you're the problem. Now look, there are images there in that that I saw. I saw people from New Apostolic Reformation, like Paula White, that I, I wouldn't recommend anybody listen to. I saw someone who seems to be tied to jihadist movements and a mom in that one thing when Trump was signing that on, at the White House right after the inauguration. I, I don't like that, okay? I don't believe we're going to build the kingdom of God on earth. But these guys do. And then they complain about other people. And there are, there are Christians. You know, there's a whole Christian reconstructionist movement, Rush Dooney and uh, you know, follow-ons like Gary North and that type of thing that will believe that we'll build this perfect kingdom and then Jesus, well, but boy, it does such a good job, I'm going back. They continue, theirs is a prophetic formula. Fight the threats to American Christian values and prepare for the eminent justice of an Armageddon, a final showdown between good and evil, between God and Satan. In this sense, every process, be it of peace, dialogue, etc., collapses before the needs of the end the final battle against the enemy, and the community of believers become a community of combatants. And you see how this narrative is set up to make evangelicals the bad guy. I once asked somebody, oh, you, you're the reason we have all these environmental disasters. And I'm like, what, what have we been in control of over the last 50 years? A good, solid evangelical. Well, James Watt was Secretary of the Interior for a short time under Ronald Reagan, 
Yeah, 30, what, 36, 35 years ago for like a year and a half? And nobody liked them then anyway. So this is, this is it's, it's what leftists in their religious zeal do. They lie and they make things up. And Jesus said, look, it's going to happen. And it's going to intensify as we move through the end time. So you need to deal with it. Uh, and so I'm not, um, such a unidirectional reading of the biblical text can anesthetize consciences or actively support the most atrocious and dramatic portrayals of a world that is living beyond the frontiers of its own promised land. So look, they're, they're right that there are abuses, but, you know, it's one of those things where, have you ever heard of a mirror? Not a mirror. <laughs> Not a mirror Safadi, a great guy, by the way. Good teacher. No, a mirror to look in and see what it is you're actually saying. Do you ever listen or read what you write and apply it to yourself? And no, they don't. And this is in the New York Times editorial page last Sunday. There, you know, there's this view that you people, you you believe. Jesus is coming back. You're crazy. Well, here's what the New York Times reported last Sunday on their editorial pages. If you don't believe in God, you're more likely to believe in UFOs, the reality of UFOs. So if that's the test for being disconnected from reality, the New York Times says you're, most like, you're more likely to not believe in God if you hold that view. But what do they do all the time? Oh, you believe in all this crazy stuff that's not real? And so, again, nobody ever holds up the mirror. So we have this, I think, we'll see increasing persecution of Christians. We have um, more lawlessness. This is Chicago suing the Justice Department over rules aimed at sanctuary cities. Because why? They, they want to do what they want to do. They don't care what the law is. And uh, Sheriff Arpaio out in Phoenix, former Sheriff Arpaio, was convicted of contempt. Honestly, I don't know why Trump doesn't pardon him right away. Okay? I, I don't know. So I, I see some things. I'm going to talk about some things I see going on that I'm concerned about. Um, this is from the New York Times, I think also a week ago. I guess two weeks ago, the diplomats can't save us. Talking about how Trump and Tillerson are changing the State Department. Now, I haven't seen a lot of evidence of that yet. The generals can't save us either. Kelly, Mattis, and McMaster are supposed to rein in the president. And so there's this narrative out there that, you know, Trump's out of control. He's doing all these things. Uh, but nobody ever questioned all the stuff that Obama did. And so, and so what they do is they build this narrative and then fit everything into it. Um, how the Trump administration broke the State Department. Yeah, I know. I, I think that's the picture of what it was like before he got there. There's all these investigations going on. Uh, the unmasking. Samantha Powers unmasked more people than anybody. Susan Rice. Uh, I hear now it says a courtesy McMaster has continued her secure, top secret security clearance so she can continue to review documents. And there was hundreds of people that were unmasked, I think illegally and improperly. And so we're, do something, somebody, just do something. Um, hire me. I'll, I'll go down there maybe, you know, if I have a, you know, could do something. Oh, by the way, there's all these stories about Mueller and how much money he walked away from. He made $3.4 million at his law firm last year, and he hired an attorney who made $5.4 million. He had another one that made one point four, another one that made two point eight. Can I dispel any? Not all lawyers make that kind of money, okay? They're lawyers in Washington, and if I've spent time in Washington, I've worked with law firms down there. Um, 
They're expensive. The lawyers do make a lot of money, way, 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 way more than they do around here. And I speak from personal experience on that. But everybody, it, it, you know, I have a conversation with these lawyers in Washington, and it's like, oh, yeah, my wife works over at this department, or now she's at this big law firm pulling down, you know, 500000 or a million dollars a year, but she used to head up this department of, department of justice. And, oh, yeah, my ex-wife, she used to work over here. I mean, it's like everybody's um, intermarried, I guess, is the way that uh, they're doing. So we live in this era, these global threats. This was a headline this week, global threats intensify. And everywhere we go, we look at this. We have this concern. Now, McMaster... I will tell you, I know that there are people that don't think that he's a problem. I have concerns about him. He seems to be pro-Iranian deal. He's, there are reports that he's been very dismissive of Israel and Israel causing all these problems in the Middle East. Same way with Mattis. And I'm, I'm concerned about that. Okay, I want to be able to support these guys, but I'm telling you, I think they're dead wrong on this. This this is a report. This is from Foreign Policy, hardly a right-wing publication. Here's the memo that blew up the NSC. An NSC staffer is forced out over a controversial member in, in memo. And here's the memo. POTUS and Political Warfare, written back in May. The guy's name was um, Higgins. And he got fired. The memo at the heart of the latest blowed up at the National Security Council presents a dark picture of media, academics, the deep state, and other enemies allegedly working to subvert U.S. President Donald Trump, according to a copy of the document obtained by foreign policy. And I looked it up, and you, you can find this memo online. Here's what, this is a quote. I'll just read a few quotes from the memo. This is not politics as usual but rather political warfare at an unprecedented level that is openly engaged in the direct targeting of a seated president through manipulation of the news cycle. And tell me, I mean, do you disagree with this? I mean, is this guy way out in right field? I guess it would be right field. Um, or is he right on target? Uh, it must be recognized on its own terms that so so that immediate action can be taken. At its core, these campaigns run on multiple lines of effort, serve as the nonviolent line of, an e of effort of a wider movement, and execute political warfare agendas that reflect cultural Marxist, Marxist outcomes. The campaigns operate through narratives. Because, of the hard, because the hard left is aligned with Islamist organizations at local, Antifa working with Muslim Brotherhood, doing businesses, MSA, uh, Muslim Students Association, and CARE, National, ACLU, ACLU and, B, and Black Lives Matter working with CARE and MPAC. And international levels, Organization of Islamic Countries working with OSCE and the UN. Recognition must be given to the fact that they seamlessly interoperate at the narrative level as well. In candidate Trump, the opposition saw a threat to the politically correct enforcement narratives that they meticulously laid out over the past few decades. In President Trump, they see a latent threat that continue that effort to ruinous effect and their retaliatory response reflects this fear. So tell me what was inaccurate in that statement. And it goes on to identify the opposition. And down here in the middle of the paragraph, it says, hence the sexism, racism, and xenophobia mems. As a Judeo-Christian culture, forced inclusion of postmodern notions and tolerance is designed to induce nihilistic contradictions that reduce all thought, all faith, all loyalties to meaninglessness. Group rights based on sex or ethnicity are a direct assault on the very idea of individual human rights and natural law around which the Constitution was framed. Transgender acceptance mems attack the most basic level at the most basic level by denying a person the right to declare the biological fact of one's sex. When a population has a 2 plus 2 equals 5 imposed on it, there are many that benefit. You know, I, I'm like, hire this man! <laughs> Give him a bonus! 
but he got fired by McMaster, and there were a couple others, Derek Harvey and a couple others that were uh, forced out. And he goes to identify the opposition, mainstream media. They do the narratives. The academy, I and mean, that's been going on for a long time, and it may have reached a point of no return. The deep state, global corporatists and bankers. This was written back in May, and this week somebody writes a a well-recent memo discussing that there may be some differences between men and women, and he gets fired by Google. This guy's almost prophetic. Democratic leadership, Republican leadership, and Islamists. Those are the oppositions. The author of the memo, Rich Higgins, who was in strategic planning, at the National Security Council was among those recently pushed out, and that included uh, Derek Harvey. Look at this, political warfare is warfare. Strategic information campaigns designed to delegitimize through disinformation arise out of nonviolent lines of effort in political warfare regimes. They run on multiple lines of operation, support the larger nonviolent line of effort. And so he and Derek Harvey, uh, McMaster took him out, Flynn, he's out, Ezra Cohen, Watnick, and Derek Harvey, all fired and out. And people that are pro-Iran agreement and I think anti-Israel are put in place. So I, you know, I'm concerned about it. Uh, Andy McCart Andrew McCarthy has a good article about McMaster and the challenge of Sharia supremacism. And I think that's a, I think it's a good one. I'm not going to go through that. You can find that over at National Review. And again, let me give a disclaimer. Just because I cite something doesn't mean I agree with everything at National Review, okay? They have a lot of guys I don't agree with. I think they're way off. But I'm just pointing out, as part of the research that I do, that this is a pretty good article. And he just says that McMaster refuses to recognize Sharia supremacism that comes out of Islam. It comes out of the holy text of Islam. And he acts like, no, 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 terrorism has nothing to do with it, with that religion. And it's just, and I'm, I'm concerned. I'm very, very concerned about that. As McCarthy, McCarthy points out, bellicose Muslim scriptures have in any event been nullified or contextualized to apply only to their 7th century conditions. Just ask anyone at Georgetown even if they don't seem to have gotten the memo in Riyadh, Tehran, Kabul, Baghdad, the Nile Delta, Peshawar, the Bekaa Valley, Aka Province, Chechnya, or swelling precincts of London, Paris, Berlin, Brussels, Malmo, Copenhagen, Rotterdam, Vienna, or pretty much any place else in the West where the Muslim population reaches a critical mass. And he, look, he prosecuted the blind shake for the first World Trade Center bombing. He knows what he's talking about. I disagree with my fellow prophecy teachers who say Islam's going to be destroyed and it's not going to be a problem. This is going to be around till the Lord returns. There are prophecies about getting rid of it. But they're associated, I think, with the end of that 70th week, not before. Only Not even half the Muslims in the world live in the Middle East anyway. The largest Muslim population countries are Indonesia, and India, and they're having problems. Indonesia, they're out running around. I, I don't remember what the article was, but uh, they're, oh, I know what it was. They had a, a statue at a, at a Confucius temple in Indonesia. So what did they do? They put a big sheet over it to cover it up before, and they're going to destroy it eventually. And this, this is Indonesia, supposedly. And I, I can tell you, heard stories about pastors being persecuted, killed in Indonesia for their faith. And I'll just note in Ezekiel 38, when it talks about what appears to be nations coming in against Israel that are largely Islamic, that, yeah, five-six are destroyed. But not five-six of everybody on the planet, it's five-six of the invading army. It still leaves other people. And I, so I know that 
I have friends that teach that they're going to be decimated, they'll be gone, and I, I don't agree, okay? I just don't agree. I don't see it, and I, I think that people are trying to force their narrative on the text. That's just my opinion, and I'll back it up, and I'll argue with you about it if you want. I don't think it's a salvation issue. So this was a, a guy, uh, the national interest, the end of alliance of America and the geopolitics of upheaval. And I mean, do we see up upheaval going on in the world today? A little does it seem a little bit like the world's off kilter, off center, that there things are erupting everywhere? Um, and this guy says it, this is probably gonna happen for a long time. So get used to it. And I I don't think I just don't think there's any stepping back at this point. And then we see this thing down in Charlottesville yesterday, and it's going to be, yep, all you Christians are white racists. Now listen, I don't care really what race you are. I care about what you believe and how you act. I don't care what race you are. And I don't think anybody in this, in the, this church does. And I grew up in conservative evangelicalism. Yeah, there are racists everywhere. There are leftists that are as bad or worse than anybody. So I don't support what these right supremacists did. I don't like the way they did it. I think everybody was trying to pick a fight. Um, and before we judge what happened with this vehicle driving into the crowd, we need to get the facts a little bit. Uh, it may be the guy is a racist. I don't know. Um, we don't really know, right? Look, what happened was horrible. You know, a couple, uh, well, three people died. The helicopter crash killed a couple that was monitoring things. A lot of people severely injured. This is, this is terrible. But the narrative will be, mark my words, this is what right-wing people do. This is what they believe and what they support. And if you say that about us or me, you're a liar. You're ignoramus, and if you do it a second time after I tell you, you're a liar. Because that's not what we believe. I personally think that a lot of this disruption in the United States is caused by this. The continuing push to divide up Israel. Caroline Glick notes this in her column on Friday, America's Strategic Paralysis. She talks about this fact that, according to senior U.S. national security source familiar with the issue, Derek Harvey advocated that the administration recognize and act on the growing threat to U.S. allies Israel and Jordan posed by Iran and Hezbollah in Syria. This week it was reported that both Israel and Jordan briefed U.S. officials involved in the ceasefire negotiations and set out their objections to continue this is ceasefire negotiations in Syria, and set out their objections to continued deployment of Iranian Hezbollah forces in the country. Harvey, the source explains, objected to the Pentagon's insistence on limiting its discussion of U.S. operations in Syria to the campaign against ISIS. He said that as Hezbollah and Iran must also be addressed. Rather than consider his position, Harvey, the source says, was shot down by his colleagues from the Pentagon who accused him of being a warmonger. And as a consequence, with U.S. forces fighting side by side now with Hezbollah in Syria, and so advancing the Iranian control over Syria, the Trump administration's policy in the country has become substantively identical to that of its predecessor. She goes on to say that the way we're acting with regard to Iran, who's developing nuclear capabilities, sends the wrong message to North Korea which, as you know, is developing its missile and nuclear technologies as well. So what, and the other interesting thing is the attacks on Trump, the investigations, you know, they raided Manafort's home. And the reason they raided Manafort's home early in the morning, even though he was turning things over, was to what? Put pressure on Manafort put pressure on those around Manafort, those associated with him and Trump. This is a prosecutorial tactic. 
And so they're going to, and, and they're doing it to Netanyahu in Israel. They're trying to get him on everything, uh, threatening to indict his wife. They have uh, picked up one of his uh, close associates, his chief of staff, I believe, Ari Haro, and they've essentially charged him with an unrelated crime. It's a lesser offense to put pressure on him to testify against Netanyahu. This is what prosecutors do. I've seen how prosecutors work. This is what Mueller is doing by raiding that, by convening a grand jury in Washington, D.C., because why? Republicans have zero support in Washington, D.C. So where would you grant? You want to get a charge? You want to justify your existence? Convene a grand jury in D.C. Probably the easiest place in the world to get an indictment against a Republican. So they're doing the same thing in Israel to get rid of Netanyahu that they're doing here to get rid of Trump. And so I just, it's to upset the political process. We had an election. Based on the way our elections run, Trump won. And now every, I Personally, I've never seen anything like it. Middle East, interesting report here. A uh, study shows murder suicides in Middle East 10 times deadlier than war. In 2015, through murder or suicide, 1.4 million Muslim men in the Middle East, the 22 countries in the Middle East, committed suicide or were murdered. 1.4 million. In one year, one year, we talk about an opioid crisis here in America. 33,000 people, 35,000 people dying in one year. This is Middle East, outside of the war, wars that are going on. It's 10 times worse murder and suicide combined. It's... Um, and you wonder how long it will go on. Well, let's talk a little bit about North Korea. I've, I'll get get us out of here. We've got a little bit of a late start. So, what's going on with North Korea? You know, Trump said fire and fury will rain down on them like the world has never seen. Now, Kim Jong Un comes out and says stuff like this all the time. And Trump responds in kind, and it's like, oh, it's Donald Trump's fault if anything happen, happens. Uh, and the papers are just full of this. Uh, Trump steps up the rhetoric. Uh, more threats from Trump. Doubles down. Uh, you know, they have this giant uh, parade in um, rally in North Korea where they and I, I give them credit. They know how to do parades over there, man. Everybody marching in a straight line, and they're better at it than just about. They make the Ohio State band look like a bunch of pikers, even though we know it's the best band in the land. And um, But they do this, and it's just it's, it's incredible. Trump warns of big trouble. World waits, President warns the forces. I mean, just the headlines, you know, the spectator, even England, fire and furry. And then Susan Rice, of course, she weighs in uh, with an editorial on Wednesday or Thursday in the New York Times saying, hey, you know, just be nice to him. It'll be okay. That's what we were. Look, there was no, he never attacked us. And, and I, he never has, right? Really. Although we lost 33,000 men in Korea, keeping the South Korea free. Um, and you have to be careful with your rhetoric. In fact, you can probably trace uh, the North Koreans' attack on the South back in 1950 to a speech given by somebody, I think the Secretary of State, that, uh, you know, we're not really going to do anything about it. And so... Kim Jong-un's grandfather, he attacked. And over a million people died. Um, the forces, I mean, this thing, if it, if it goes, I mean, this is sort of an indication of they have 
North Korea has 1.28 million troops, 7.62 million reserves. South Korea has 625,000 plus 28,500 Americans and 3.1 million reserves, and they have missiles. But look at the number of multiple rocket launchers that they have in North Korea, 5,500 versus 240, 40 of ours and 200 of South Korea. And the fear is if something goes wrong, that um, it, it's v virtually impossible to take them out, take North Korea out in a first strike. It's just, it's just not possible. And so estimates of what would happen uh, even if they try to take out the leadership, there's people behind Kim Jong-un that are trained in his ideology that will try to continue. And the low side of the estimates I've seen are a million dead, some in a week. And he has all these rocket launchers and artillery aimed at Seoul, a city of, what, 20-some million people within sight of the border where he has all these artillery. It, and other estimates, I've seen as high as 10 million people in short order could be killed. And then the question is, you know, is this being made up? I don't know. Okay, I've, their rockets seem to be developing. Even the ones that look like they were destroyed, it looks like they were doing controlled steering of the rockets. So I think they've gotten pretty sophisticated. The uh, Washington Post came out with articles uh, about the fact that they have this capability. They may have as many as 60 nukes. Israel might have 80. They're, and everybody says they're probably a nuclear power. Here's a report. Uh, Director of Defense Studies, Harry Kazianis, who's with us along with the former CIA military analyst, Tara Muller. So, all right, guys, good to see both of you. I'm going to start, Harry, with you on this. And it's the newest, as I said, development on top of a number of other developments that lead us to believe this week that tensions have spiked, right, with North Korea. But this is a um, kind of, a, I guess, a technological development. What do you make of it? Well, Connell, I think, I think today at 1222, when the Washington Post story broke, we can definitively declare North Korea a nuclear power. Hmm. Not only a nuclear wow. power, but a power that can hit the United States with an intercontinental ballistic missile. The report also says that North Korea not only has 12 to 20 nuclear weapons, like we've been saying for quite a long time now, but 60 nuclear weapons. So these are all game-changing revelations that we have to be concerned about. The biggest takeaway, we are out of time. We are out of time to stop North Korea from getting a nuclear weapon. And that's Here's another report. Let's spring in now from uh, the Fox News military analyst, Colonel David Hunt, who, who joins us. And just to, uh, Colonel, continue that conversation. I'm sure you heard at least the, the latter part of it on this use of force and whether preemptive military action is on the table. What are the consequences of that to the point about whether we have any, quote, good options here? Yeah, let's understand a couple of things. We've been historically 40 years under the threat of nuclear attack from China and Russia. We, we'll get through this okay, we, with, and with a lot more missiles than North Korea supposedly have. But the, what's, what's happening is people are talking about preemptive strikes or, or decapitation as if they're going to be 100% successful with no repercussions. And all the war games we've ever done, uh, the, the, if we decide to do a preemptive strike, the North Koreans will get a six to eight minute warning. Six to eight minutes is enough for hundreds of thousands of rounds to go from 30 miles south of the demilitarized zone from North Korea. Right. The other thing is if we decide we're going to go on the ground, we have to move soldiers and we have to move Marines and aircraft. It's not going to be a secret. North Korea is not going to lay down. We would win the war not an issue about who would win. We have the greatest military it's, we've ever had. It's phenomenal. However, the, the, the civilian consequences are, would be a million casualties plus in the first three or four days alone. Uh, that may be too much for anybody to swallow. So talking tough to me doesn't work as well as preparation. And the last point, we do not have a very good missile defense. It's shooting a bullet down with another bullet. And we're less than 50% on our tests. So, yeah, we've got to get on that if we're seriously going to do something. Because as hard as we want to hit North Korea, they get to punch back. And this is a, a I thought it was a video. I guess not. This is a military display that they put on in China recently. 
And China and North Korea have been close. Now, look, here's the takeaway. Iran is stepping in. China seems to be backing off a little bit. And Iran's stepping in and becoming North Korea's best friend. North Korea needs cash. Well, who got billions of dollars of cash out of the Obama administration? Iran. What are they doing with it? Well, they're, I have no doubt they're buying nuclear technology and missile technology from North Korea, which North Korea appears to be getting from China. Um, so you have this convergence of all of these countries. And the reason why it's sort of urgent is that uh, Russia has a, mili has a demographic problem. Uh, they're a declining population. They have, they have a bad economy, but they've developed some great uh, technology that, from my research, indicates that our aircraft carriers have no defense against the hypersonic missiles that Russia has developed. Those missiles travel at Mach 8, which is about 6,000 miles an hour. We have some laser and rail guns that if you, that's, by the way, 6,000 miles an hour is a really fast bullet. And we have some technologies that we're developing, but they're not there yet. And they essentially make our aircraft carriers sitting ducks to be taken out. So while we have naval superiority, uh, the, the, our defenses haven't developed to keep up with that yet. And so now you have this convergence of, and so everybody's distracted by North Korea. And at the meantime, you have Russia, Iran, and Syria in talks about how Russia, Iran, and Turkey involved in talks about how to divide up Syria and putting things on place on the Syrian border. And how are they going to do this? And what they're going to do? This is from the Tehran Times. Iran has emerged as a major player, major player in resolving Syrian crisis, diplomat says. And that's things that fit into um, Bible prophecy. But And here's this article. This was Rouhani's um, inauguration this week. And you see the guy in white, the little frail guy, that's Khomeini. And that's Rouhani. He was sworn in for another four-year term. And then what you'll see is you'll see a couple people here in the crowd. There's Khamenei, the supreme leader. And this guy, who's that? He is Kim Yong nam president of the Presidium of the Supreme People's Assembly of North Korea. By some intelligence estimates, he's the number two guy in North Korea. And there he is in the front row at Rouhani's swearing in. Now you also see the European foreign minister there in her head covering at the same inauguration. So we have this, Iran is flexing its muscle in uh, Afghanistan. They are on the northern border. And while Trump met with Hariri, the head of Lebanon, Hezbollah is moving in to Lebanon. And there's this convergence of the urgent, what I emerging convergence of the urgent. Here is this report. Um, now I'm going to forget the source. It was in an intelligence report. Here's what it says. The Arab states have no time to deal with the Palestinian issue as they are up to their necks in wars taking place on their territories or near their borders. Libya, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen have all been in a state of war for several years now. And so what, what you have is this convergence of, we know these things are going to happen in the end times. And we know that they appear to be close, but they may be even a little bit closer than we think because demographically, Russia has a problem. Economically, it has a problem. Iran has you know, some demographic issues and a growing dis dissent within its, its country. So we have this convergence of all these people who 
they're running out of time to do something. Ch China has a debt bomb that appears to be going off pretty soon. I mean, it's just, um, you know, we're in kind of a bubble on the stock market and real estate here in the United States again. That didn't end well in 2008, and by some estimates, it appears to be worse now than it was then. Um, I'm just saying is all these things that are happening are happening. So up here in northeast Lebanon, what happened is Hezbollah put, pushed out the Syrian rebels, and they're consolidating their control over Lebanon. So Hariri comes, and you know Trump shakes his hand and says they're going to fight Hezbollah, but that's not really the reality of what's going on over there. Hezbollah continues to um, rise. And so what, what you have up there, and it, it continues all over the Syrian theater. It even goes over into eastern Syria. Hezbollah is taking over these areas from the rebel armies, and they're in control. Hezbollah is what? It's Iran. It's a proxy for Iran. Here's what this article says. Intoxicated with victory, Hezbollah activists have warned that Arsal, that's up there in northeastern Lebanon border area, is just an exercise uh, for a war with Israel. Senior members of the organization have even compared their war to the Iraqi army's victory over ISIS in Mosul. Commentators in the Sunni world have warned that the real goal of Hezbollah's operation is to perform an ethnic cleansing and expel not only the al-Nusra front organization, which is now called Fatah al-Sham, uh, to the Syrian city of Idlib, but the entire Sunni population. So there's all of these things are converging, and then over in the oil fields over here uh, in uh, eastern Syria, what used to be called Syria, there's all these things going on. And so the question is, what I, I'm just saying is that Iran is consolidating its control over these areas. The Shiites are driving out the Sunnis. And this is, Russia did this. This is how all those people ended up in Europe. They were bombed. Remember the guy from the uh, NATO who said that they were attacking people to get people on the move. And so all of this is leading to, in some, this is in front page mag, the third Lebanon war, not a matter of if, but when. Um, interesting times. Uh, the, the window in which a lot of these, I think, these things that are prophesied can happen is narrowing. That's why it's called the convergence of the urgent. They have to act soon before things change. So I think, I think it could happen very soon. Now, look, could be wrong. Could unwind and everything get peaceful and nice now for a while. But it just seems like there's too many things in play all at the same time. So what does this mean? It means we need to be about getting our lives in order and sharing the gospel with as many people as we can because time is short. And I remember growing up in the 60s, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I remember asking my mom, I was like uh, nine years, eight or nine years old, hey, what's this mean? We're going to have a nuclear war. Okay, <laughs> I'd read about Hir Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I knew what that meant. Um, and we could be living at that time again. We don't know what North Korea is going to do. The guy is unpredictable, not rational. The Russians were rational. The Chinese are rational. But this guy is, he's been raised to think he's a god. That would interfere with his ability to reason. So look, we live in interesting times, and it's time to get ready. So let's pray, and we'll pick this up next week. Father, thank you again for the blessing that you gave us to live not only at this time, but to have your word that gives us a picture of what to expect so that we won't be distressed by the distressing things that we see. Keep us in your word, committed to you, and give us a dose of your Holy Spirit so that we can understand the times in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen.